Hello everyone, welcome back. This is chapter 2, part 8. In this part, we will talk about demand curve, demand for goods and services. And we will also talk about price elasticity of demand in the context of public finance. So, you have probably seen demand curve and price elasticity of demand in your principles of microeconomics classes, macro classes probably. And not the elasticity part, but elasticity is definitely in the micro class, intermediate micro class, or in the labor economics class. But this is going to be, this topic will be covered in the context of public finance and the theoretical foundations of public finance. So we are now on the equilibrium and social welfare portion of this chapter. So welfare economics, let's talk about the welfare economics. It's the study of determinants of welfare or well-being in a society. So it depends on the right social efficiency, that's the size of the economic pie, but also it depends on the redistribution. Okay, so demand curves, we need to first talk about the demand curves, price elasticity of demand to talk about social welfare. Uh, because we need to derive the demand curve, then we need to derive the supply curve, put them together, equilibrium. And we're going to talk about consumer surplus, producer surplus, economic efficiency, social surplus. And that's the size of the pie. And then we're going to talk about social welfare coming up. All right. So the demand curve shows the relationship between the price of a good and the quantity of a good demanded. And there's always a negative relationship for a usual demand curve. Oh, I wanted to just say something. So as you know, I went to UT Austin. So today I'm wearing my school's little jersey for you guys. <laughs> and a couple of people were asking me where I got my PhD in economics from. So I'm a Longhorn. I got my PhD in economics and uh, uh, my subfield in economics. But my subfields are labor economics and also macroeconomics. Okay, going back. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to derive the demand curve from utility maximization problem as shown in the upcoming figure. All right. So imagine world where we are either eating cakes and or we are consuming movies, right? So that's the quantity of cakes in the y-axis and quantity of movies to good goods that we are consuming, right? So this is an indifference curve. So this one is, I'm gonna call it IC1. Indifference curve one, it shows the locus of all points that gives you the same level of utility or happiness satisfaction. This is the budget constraint or budget line. By the way, you can watch these videos for this unit, unit two. Indifference curves are explained in part one and part two budget line is in part three and then we learned about utility max constraint utility maximization in the subsequent parts okay so this is the optimal point right initial utility maximizing point gives the uh price of movies and quantity of movies combination so here right i have this budget line y divided by price of movies if i spend all my money income on the movies these mini movies i can consume and for instance this intercept was y total income no saving no borrowing all these were explained previously and i actually hate that when <laughs> they do it in cooking shows this has been prepared they're like we're gonna put this in the oven and then oh i already had a prepared version and it drives me crazy but we have been building up to this part, part eight. I can give you everything in a nutshell, which I'm doing. All right, so this is the budget constraint with the intercepts. Okay, with the initial price level, right, PM, you get this optimal level of quantity of movies consumed, okay? If the price, remember, if the price goes up, this guy is going to swivel in, it's going to shift inwards, right? along the x-axis so i'm going to get rid of all this stuff let's do just erase this because my drawing is very subpar i want to just play the slides that's why i prepare very nice slides okay so now price of movies has increased 
So the budget line, right? Raising price of movies gives another price quantity of movies consumed combination with fewer movies demanded. How come? My budget line, as I said, will sh uh, shift in. And then what happens is that you're going to move to a lower indifference curve, unfortunately. It's okay. This implies quantity of movies going down. So what happened? Price went up initially, right? Quantity of movies went down. So this is both income and substitution effects, all right? When the price of movies further goes up, you're going to maybe move to even lower indifference curve. I see three. How did we find this? We're just looking at this parallel family of indifference curves, okay? And what's happening here is that we're finding that tangency point between the new budget constraint and the indifference curve, whatever indifference curve it is. Okay, so raising price of movies even more gives another price of movies, quantity of com movies combination with even less movies demanded. So price of movies going, right? Up, quantity of movies demanded is going down. This is what we call the law of demand. Law, oh, I love this. Law of demand. I'm getting so much demand for also recording courses on principles of microclass. That's next, hopefully. All right, so this gives us various combinations of price of movies and quantity of movies that can be so these combinations right first combination second the third you know these combinations can be mapped into price quantity space gives us demand curve for movies so if you do this price of movies here remember from principles of microeconomics class and this is a quantity of movies on the x-axis so as the price of movies, you know, this is the highest price, remember, corresponds to this, this budget constraint. All right. So at this high price of movies, quantity demanded is QM3 lower. At a lower price of movies, remember, I'm going back to this graph, lower price is here and the lowest is here. With the lower price of movies, check this out. Quantity demanded is here, higher, right? So with lower price of movies, quantity demanded is higher. With the lowest price and an even lower price for movies, quantity demanded is even uh, higher, right? So when we connect these dots, various combinations of points like this create the demand curve. So this is demand for movies. You can have a letter D for demand. And it's going to show you the negative relationship between price of movies, price of a good, and the quantity of that good demanded. All right. And vice versa, folks, if price of movies go down, quantity of movies will go up. Okay. So let's talk about elasticity of demand. So this concept is so exciting for me because for some businesses, let's say you're dropping the price to increase demand, right? Yes, you're going to drop the price, demand will go up. But if the demand goes up less than the initial price drop, then you're going to lose money. In some other case, if you drop the price, demand response is very strong then you're going to actually make more money. Your profits will go up. Your total revenue will go up. So elasticity of demand is extremely important in, for instance, when government decides to subsidize college education. So again, you pay about one third of your the cost of the college education. I'm going to put a student. And two thirds of the, yes, college is very expensive, but you're still not paying the full cost of it. You only pay one third. Two thirds of it is paid by taxpayers. I'm going to draw an old person or myself. I pay lots of taxes. I look like I have a really big nose. Anyways, going back. Uh, so government is subsidizing the college education. Reason being, it's making the price of college education cheaper so that more people will enroll, right? 
and it has actually a good positive externality. We want lots of college educated people. Hopefully they're going to go get better jobs that are paying higher. Check out my labor economics, human capital chapter. That's a pretty good chapter. Okay. So elasticity of demand is defined as a percentage change in quantity demanded divided by the percentage change in prices. Okay. So this is basically change in quantity demanded. So you can write it like final quantity demanded minus initial quantity demanded Q1, right? Divided by initial, if we divide everything by final price P2 minus P1 divided P1. And you can of course multiply everything by 100, but because you have that 100 in both numerator and denominator, you can actually cancel them. Okay, so let's practice this. Price of movies increases from $8 to $12. This is a blank percent rise in price. And if the number of movies purchased fell from 6 to 4, there's a blah blah percent reduction in quantity demanded. The demand elasticity is therefore, what is it? Okay, so let's work on this. I actually want you to pause this video and work on this on your own. Go ahead and pause it. And after you finish, keep watching it. I'm waiting for you. Five hours later, <laughs> just like in that um, SpongeBob SquarePants. Okay, so let's calculate percentage change in quantity demanded okay so i'm going to calculate the top part okay so i'm going to actually use this one q2 minus q1 divided by q1 and final price minus oh, final price p2 minus p1 Okay, I actually don't like the way it's written, so I'm going to clean this up a little bit. I also didn't like this Q. Minus Q1. P2, this is a 2, those divided. Minus P1 divided by P1. Okay, what is P1? What's Q1? What is it? You know. Alright, so... It's first asking me about price increases. Okay, so it's let's first calculate the denominator then. Okay, price is increasing. Okay, P2 minus P1. So it was initially $8 P1 to increase to P2. Okay, so I can calculate this independently here. Let me do that. P2, which is, let's use this portion. P2 minus P1, 12 minus 8. What's the initial price level? P1 is $8. So, 12 minus 8 is 4. 4 over 8 is 1 over 2 times 100. This is 50%. Okay, so this is a 50% rise in price. So, I'm going to plug this in at the bottom. 50%. Okay. All right. A number of movies purchased fall from six to four. Interesting. So six is, this is quantity. Quantity one is six. Quantity two, final quantity is four. Okay. So then let's calculate this portion. Q2 is four minus initial quantity six. Divide by initial quantity is 6 again. Okay. So it's negative 2 over 6 times 100. So it's going to be minus 33.3333%. Okay. If you do this. So it's 33.33%. And it's a negative number. Don't forget the negative sign. Never forget it. Okay, so it's going to be a negative number, right? So what was it? Change in quantity. So minus 2 over 6, change in quantity demanded. 
divide by change in price 1 over 2 so it's negative I'm just showing you a different way of doing this this one comes up flipped in terms of multiplication 2 over 1 okay so it's minus 4 over 6 okay so it's minus 2 over 3 I'm also going to use a calculator because we like to be precise. You can always find negative 2 over 3 or what percentage is that? So 33.33 .33 divided by 50. You're going to get, you're going to find minus, don't forget minus 0 0.66. Interesting. In English, translating this to English. Number one, price elasticity of demand is... 0 0.66 so we're gonna write it down here let's write everything down down 0 point negative 0 0.66 price increases by 50 percent quantity demanded fell down by 33.3 percent 33.3 okay all right so what does this mean in english let me translate really quickly if price of a good increases, let's say by one percentage points, quantity demanded will go down, but less than one percentage points. To be precise, it's going to go down by 0.66 percentage points. So we call this inelastic demand. Responsiveness is lower. Okay? So demand elasticities are negative numbers, right? They are not constant along a demand curve. Even as a linear demand curve at higher price levels, this is quantity, this is price. Even if you have a linear demand curve, what you have is at lower prices, the elasticity is lower. Here you have more elastic, uh, unit elastic, here you have more elastic demand because when the price is high, people tend to respond even heavier. So let's learn about two extremes. This is my favorite. Perfectly inelastic demand curve. Elasticity of demand is zero. Quantity doesn't change when price goes up or down vertical. So these things don't mean anything to me. This is how I am going to suggest you learn this. Check this out. This is so cool. Okay, so perfectly, I'm not going to draw it actually, I'm going to show you something. So when you write perfectly inelastic, right, I'm going to grab a highlighter and grab a cool color. Perfectly inelastic, extend this eye all the way. Do you know what it tells you? Perfectly inelastic means perfectly vertical demand curve let me show you quantity is here price is here your demand curve looks like this very strange okay so what does this mean basically the tail is not supposed to be here so pardon my so if price is low guess what i need to consume let's say one unit if price is higher i still need to consume one unit Price is even higher. I still need to use one unit. This is perfect in elastic demand is, for instance, demand for EpiPens. Do you guys know what EpiPen is? EpiPens are those injection syringes pre-filled for allergies. Extreme, I'm not talking about, you know, seasonal aller allergies. This is like extreme allergies. Let's say somebody has extreme allergies to peanuts. They cannot even breathe, right? You just inject yourself with EpiPen and they, their body immediately recovers. So I need, let's say, if I am, may God prevent, I have some sort of, you know, allergies like that. I'm allergic to peanuts. I am not. But I'm eating peanuts by mistake and I need an EpiPen. Even if the price of one EpiPen is $5,000, I still need it. Same thing is for diabetics uh, medication and other life-saving medications that you're supposed to have. So demand is 
the constant number regardless of the price. So we call this perfectly inelastic, inelastic. Perfectly elastic. Oh, I like right doing this too. So when you write this perfect elastic, right? Perfectly. I'm going to put P. Perfectly. Let's write elastic. Boom. Extend this because it's going to be perfectly horizontal elastic. But it's not just elastic. We are talking about perfectly elastic demand curve. Perfectly elastic demand curves are perfectly horizontal. And this means there is demand for one price level only. If the price, let me fix this demand. I don't like this Freddy Krueger intervention. If you've been watching my videos, you know that insider are insider jokes. Look, Freddy Krueger strikes a gun. Okay, so that means there's demand. If the price is exactly at this level, demand disappears when the price is any other price. So this is basically an example of agriculture. There's usually, per, agricultural market is perfectly elastic. It has perfect elastic demand for the market of apples, for instance. Okay, it's a very homogeneous good. We studied this in principles of microeconomics. And... Usually you have this kind of demand curve. So price of a bushel of apples is set, you know, you know, in the wholesale level. And let's say you have an apple orchard. You want to sell your apples for $1 million per bushel or even above that market rate. Let's say market rate is $60 per bushel. You want to get paid $60.50. No wholesaler is going to buy your apple. Or this happens actually gas stations, gas stations that are positioned either across from each other like this or right next to each other. Yesterday, I actually bought gas from two gas stations. One was called QT. The other one was Exxon. They had exactly the same price. Okay. So I went to the first one. Yes. So you can sell your gas in at one price. If you try to sell at higher price, nobody will buy it because there's cheaper right next door. Elasticity of demand in this case has is negative infinity. So the quantity changes infinitely. That means it goes down to zero, right? Even a small change in price. So you have perfect horizontal demand curve. So folks, if it's perfectly e elastic, you have, perfectly horizontal, perfectly inelastic, you have perfectly vertical. So anything that's inelastic is going to be more vertical-ish. Anything that's more relatively more elastic will be flatter. Keep that in mind. Okay. So with this inelastic demand curve, ooh, this is better. Of course, my slides are better than my drawing. Inelastic demand curve for movies. Let's say this person wants to see exactly QM2 units of movies, regardless of price. I don't care if it's $30, $20, $10. I have to see John Wick, the latest movie. Okay. So they say actually that movie has best hand-to-hand -hand combat scenes in the in a long time. I'm not going to cause any, <laughs> I don't want to cause any, you know, discussions. All right. So with this inelastic demand curve, you want to consume QM and this is a perfectly elastic. Again, these are perfectly elastic demand curve. You can choose any amount at PM2. So if the price is this level, I'm actually indifferent between getting M, I can get M3, two or one units of movies, okay? So in general, elasticity, in general, this is your general elasticity lesson. In elasticity, divides the percentage change in the dependent variable, in this case, it's quantity of movies, by the percentage change in the independent variable, that's the cause, right? Price of movies. Independent variable is usually the cause we're looking at. Dependent is the effect, okay? So... Elasticity is usually, you know, whatever we have on the x-axis is usually the cause affecting the y variable, okay? Y is often 
quantity demanded or quantity supplied, while X might be on price of the good, cross price, price of related good, or your income, income elasticity of demand. So if you're curious about more elasticity topics, I'm actually going to post a link to another class, couple of videos that I teach elasticity. All right, folks, we're done with part eight. Now we're moving to part nine, supply curve, and we are going to talk about the concept of equilibrium so that we can put everything together. I'll see you there. Bye.